What is up everybody? It is Scott here on the Dog Dad channel on YouTube and today is actually the continuation or the final piece of a video that I started with Sorrow that we've got here with us today from Sorrow Dog Training, the YouTube channel Sorrow Dog Training, S-A-R-O Dog Training. And this is going to be level three of raw feeding. Over on Sorrow's channel, we have level one and level two. So I really encourage you guys before you watch this one or after you watch this one to go over to Sorrow's channel. Again, it's Sorrow dog training and watch level one and level two so that this all makes a little bit more sense especially if you are a beginner so let's go ahead and move on to level three i'm going to hand it over to sorrow so that we can get started with our questions and sorrow thank you for joining me thank you very much hello dog lovers my name is sorrow i'm a dog trainer also coach dog owners my channel is sorrow dog training as uh, scott mentioned and we are following up on level three of raw feeding. Let's say we have uh, transitioned from kibble feeding our dogs to a little bit of fresh food. Uh, we've added some fresh food maybe, and then slowly we've transitions, uh, transitioned to raw diet, and we're feeding our dog raw diet for a while, and we're just feeding maybe some ground beef, some ground chicken, and it's been a month or maybe even six months we've been feeding our dog raw diet. We've transitioned completely to raw diet. Now we're feeling comfortable, we're feeling okay, everything is going well with our dog. What do we do next? What is the level three which we want to get into a little bit more in depth to understand what do we do now that we know all these um, aspects of healthy feeding our dog or species appropriate feeding our dog um, now we want to start challenging ourselves or going to the next level so scott can you explain to us um, what do we do now we feed, we've been feeding meat maybe maybe a little bit of uh, blueberries <laughs> maybe a little bit of uh, vegetables here and there what can we start doing now so <clears throat> this is really where Oh, it looks like we're a little, the volume's a little loud. <laughs> Is mine? I think so over on that end, but it's totally fine. This is what happens when we do recordings, right? Okay. <laughs> How about uh, now? It should be better now. Yeah, totally better now. Uh, so here is really my thing. This is where we get into the realm of really how I end all of my training, whether it's people that I work with one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's my book my course my six-week boot camps whatever it is the end is always okay you are you know transitioned over to raw foods you're feeding exclusively raw and fresh foods but you're not done and you're never going to be like it doesn't sound like a fun thing to say because it makes it sound like you haven't like there's no accomplishment there but it's it's not that at all it's just that you have made a huge step and you're at a huge milestone now but there's always going to be more to learn it doesn't mean that you need to be constantly stressing yourself out about you know every single raw feeding book that comes out i have to read or every seminar that comes out i have to attend or every conference that gets put on i have to go to it's not about that it's more about over time trying to up our game and do a little bit better and most importantly being open to new information because the biggest problem that I see is that, and I was one of these people for a long time where we get set into our ways and we form an opinion about something with our dog's diet and anybody mentioning anything other than that, we automatically disagree with because it's just where, you know, we've almost become ego invested in our opinion where, you know, a couple of years ago, if you asked me, I would have told you that I don't think that vegetables and fruits have any place in, in a dog's diet. And now I'm completely 180. I've seen so much information and so much hard science telling me different that to ignore it would just be doing my dogs and myself and the audience that follows me an injustice or dis disservice there we go both of them i guess but a disservice really so that's the biggest thing is not getting stuck in your ways and continuing to learn and probably the biggest one here is 
uh, realizing that while, and I teach this too, that the 80, 10, 5, 5 stuff is an amazing place to start, but that's exactly what it is. It's an amazing place to start. And you have to observe and adjust and add things onto the diet from there. I like Can to call that. Can explain what is 80, 10, 5, 5? Yes. So the 80, 10, 5, 5 is basically just this really arbitrary uh, equation, if you want to call it that, that we use to feed our dogs. And it is essentially 80% muscle meat, 10% bone content, 5% liver, and 5% other non-liver organs. This could be spleens, this could be kidney, this could be uh, pancreas, and on and on and on. <clears throat> but this is just a way for us to say, all right, we're adding at least this base of stuff to our dog's food in an effort to get as many vitamins and nutrients and macronutrients and everything like that into our dogs as possible. But the problem is that it's not in itself and this is something I've been guilty of in the past, it's not, it's not a complete diet. Like we can't feed just that <clears throat> and have all of our bases covered. We need to feed additional things. And there's a million ways to do it. <laughs> um, I recently put out a video saying, if you come across somebody on the internet, whether it's dog training, whether it's fresh foods, I was obviously talking about raw feeding specifically because that's what I teach people. But if you come across somebody on the internet in the dog space that is saying, there's one way to do things and it's my way. And the only way that I'm going to tell you that way is if you give me money. And if you don't do it my way, you're going to hurt your dog run because it's not true. There's so many different ways to accomplish a set amount of things. I mean, if you ask a hundred dog trainers how to teach a dog to sit, you're going to get a hundred different answers, right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> and it's the same thing with um, <clears throat> transitioning to raw foods and feeding raw foods. There's no one way to do it. You know, there's just a, the dog training sit example. You know, 90 of those ways may not work for your dog, but 10 of those ways did work for your dog to teach them how to sit. And the other 90 just made no sense to them and was frustrating for you, was frustrating for the dog and blah, 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 blah. So the whole point coming back to this is that we need to go farther than 80, 10, 5, 5. And there's a ton of different ways we can do this. We can, you know, hire somebody like Ronnie Lejeune from Perfectly Rawsome, perfectlyrawsome.com to create a custom meal for us where you literally say here's the access to stuff that I have here's my budget here's where I live this is how much my dog weighs does my dog have this allergy or that allergy and she will basically say okay here is this um, piece of information this document this pdf feed exactly this you know wow. feed 1.75 grams of this feed two ounces of liver feed two ounces, you know, very, very specific. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so that's one way to do it. There's also uh, using pre-mades that go farther than 80, 10, 5, 5, something like answers pet food, uh, which is available in many places across the country. If you're in Southern California, there are companies like vibrant canine. If you are in Texas, there are companies like bones and co. Uh, there's tons of different companies out there. I encourage you to check on the reputation of these companies before buying from them, but that's another way to do it. So, so far we have, you know, basically paying somebody to say, feed exactly this. Then we have the paying somebody to say, um, you know, make your food for you, essentially, the pre-made stuffs. Then we kind of get into what I do, which is completely do-it-yourself levels. And again, there's no perfect way or one way to do this. And I'm not saying that my way is either. Uh, I don't think that there is one. As a human species, we do not know exactly what dogs need. We just don't. Uh, the numbers that we have right now to make the foods that we have are mostly based on two different pieces of information or two different sets of it, numbers that two organizations called NRC and AFCO have provided us. So when you go to the grocery store and you look at, you know, this bag of kibble, and it says complete and balanced, 
that means that it's adhering to those standards. You know, this food is balanced according to AFCO standards, which is the numbers of saying you need this much magnesium and you need this much iron and you need uh, this much manganese and so on and so on. Uh, they're Can we trust <clears throat> AFCO? It is an amazing, it's an amazing set of information. We got it through some pretty ugly means by essentially reducing and denying dogs with certain things uh, until they got sick. You know, how long can, or how long can a dog go without iron or how low can we drop iron in a dog's diet before they start to have problems? So I have a problem with how we got the numbers. <clears throat> but there's literally millions of dogs across the country that have lived healthy, long lives on foods that are based on AFCO numbers. The same with NRC numbers. Um, it's, it's an amazing set of information. And when you go to somebody like Ronnie Lejeune that creates meals based on NRC standards, you are really hard pressed to get something that is more complete, if you want to call it that, a complete and balanced diet. So it's kind of a multifaceted question. Yes, we can. If you give the exact amount of these different macronutrients and vitamins and micronutrients and so on that these two organizations are stating, you, unless you have a dog that has some kind of other underlying issue, chances are you're going to have a very, very healthy dog. Uh, there's just some background stuff that kind of makes you go, hmm. Like, uh, I, I think we talked about this in level one and level two, so I, I'll be brief on it. But when we look at a company like, or an organization like AFCO, this is a board of people, an organization that have said, hmm, you know, maybe it is okay to feed cattle Skittles as a quote, you know, good source of dietary sugar. Maybe it's okay to reuse roofing products and roofing chemicals from California as supplements for reptiles. Maybe it's okay to feed cattle the waste and leftovers from grocery stores without removing the styrofoam or plastic first. So, yes, the numbers themselves are useful and you can feed a dog a very, 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 very healthy diet with them. Mm -hmm. I just also have issues with the organization itself because of how they came to these numbers. And I hope we never do that stuff again. Mm -hmm. um, but coming back to the way that I like to do things, I like to provide as many beneficial things as I can, putting in the essential things and trying to pack my dogs full of as many complete food systems as I can. And when I say a complete food system, and a lot of this information is coming from, you know, years of learning and people like Billy from Answers and working with people like Ronnie and, you know, just the years of accumulated information of when I say a complete food system, I mean everything that is necessary. So like if we look at a fish, like there are, and I'm not saying that just because wolves do it, we should do it for our dogs. This is just an example, an arbitrary example. There are packs of wolves who survive almost exclusively on fish. They are complete. They're a complete food. Everything that we are trying to give to our dogs, right? They have you know, essential vitamins and nutrients. They have omega-3s. They have the brains, the eyes, the bone content, the meat content, the hearts, all the other organs, the liver, the kidneys, I mean, lungs, and so on and so on. It's a complete food system, which is why I prefer to feed uh, things like smelt, which are small, whole fish, and I feed the entire thing. I also feed some of the larger stuff sometimes, like, you know, mackerel and so on, but it's a complete food. Like it, it is complete. Like the whole food is there. Mm, yeah. I also like to feed things that are going to up my dog's immune system and support their gut health, which is going to be fermented foods. Whether this is a fermented dairy product like kefir or if it's a fermented, you know, vegetable-based product like fermented veggies, obviously, <laughs> a vegetable-based fermented product, fermented veggies, right? Um, but these things are going to help our dog's gut health, which in turn, I mean, we're learning so much about 
the microbiome, which is just a fancy way of saying our dog's gut, and the really the little ecosystem that is our dog's mm -hmm. gut is the microbiome, and that has so much impact on us and our dogs. We're learning it's, you know, has connections to how we act psychologically, our mood, our behaviors, but specifically in this example, it has a massive impact, and there's no question, on our dog's immune system. So if you have a dog with a very poor, very weak microbiome, a terrible gut going on, then more than likely, you're not going to have a very strong immune system either. The point being, the more that we can support our dog's digestive system, specifically their gut, their microbiome, whatever term you want to use, the stronger of an immune system they're going to have, which goes towards all the things that we're trying to do with raw feeding. You know, healthier dogs, longevity, less issues, less vet visits, you know, happier, all around better lives. All these things are going to be increased by, you know, higher immunity, not mm -hmm. having to deal with disease, being able to fight off potential disease easier, fighting off things like cancer and so on and so on. So when you say you mentioned kind of essentials, is there essentials, is there a list of essentials or are there anything that you can consider as essentials that people should be concerned, considering having those for sure in their dog's meal? Yes. Uh, one, if you want a very, very uh, well-documented more than I ever will because I just don't have the patience to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> I prefer working one-on-one -on -one with people, but, uh, Ronnie Lejeune, again, perfectly awesome. She has a list of essential, uh, you know, vitamins, nutrients, and so on and so on. And I highly recommend that you guys check that out. There's macronutrient information over there, micronutrient information. I highly recommend that you go and look at it. So you can go and look at it and say, how much iron does my dog need? And she'll list out potential sources for iron, you know, mm -hmm. For example, you can go and look at iodine. You know, what are some sources for iodine? Oh, kelp powder is a source of iodine. I can find that on Amazon. <clears throat> Here's some other foods that I can find it on. I can find it at Walmart, so great place. But a specific example is, I guess, more specific or an additional specific besides the kelp powder that has the iodine in it. One thing that people often miss out on and isn't accounted for <clears throat> in the 801055 specifically is fish or more specifically omega-3s um, and when we say by the way an essential you know vitamin an essential this an essential that nutritionally speaking when we say essential it means that the dog's body needs it you know we have essential things right. too but the dog's body needs it and it can't convert it from anything else. So our dogs have the ability to bring certain things in and turn them into other things that they need, as an example. But omega-3s are not one of them. So uh, from, the, from the food that they eat, from the meat that they eat, mm -hmm. they, can trans, they can transform it to what they need. Yes, so there are, there are foods that they can take in and turn into other things that they need, but, mm -hmm. Basically, they can convert it, but right. they can't do that for omega-3s. Like, there's nothing that your dog can consume that isn't an omega-3 and then turn it into a source of omega-3s. It has to be an omega-3 when it comes in. So, again, and that is fish, right? yes, uh, omega-3s are huge in fish, whole oily fish is what we're looking for you know you can it doesn't have to be whole you can still get oily fish from part of a salmon and obviously unless you're you have a monster dog you're probably yeah. not feeding your dog an entire salmon at once um <clears throat> but oily fish is what we're looking for that's the natural source for one natural source for omega-3s okay and it's the most readily available and cost effective you know, you can go to the store and get cans of, you know, sardines in water, in water, not oil or lemon pepper or Cajun sauce or anything, but sardines in water for what, you know, 20 cents, 25, 50 cents a can. Mm. And that's a good source of omega-3s. You can get salmon. You can get things like I was just talking about a few minutes ago, uh, smelt. 
You can get mm. mackerel, mm. especially if you have places like, you know, an Asian market or a Polynesian market or, you know, whatever you happen to have in your area, the Japanese market, the Chinese mm. market. Um, there's going to be so many fish, more fish than you ever knew even existed. <laughs> like You're <laughs> like, what is this parrot fish? What is this? Right. I don't even know blue gill <laughs> i don't even know what there's so yeah. many things there but <clears throat> we're looking for oily fish here in this particular case uh, because it's my preferred thing it's not the only option there are other options for omega-3s but then we start getting into things like oils and there's big mm. problems that come with a lot of the oils out there because lots of companies saw the craze about fish oil in the, in the last couple of years and like, all right, let's start producing a fish oil and aren't necessarily producing high quality fish oils all the time. You know, somebody like Rodney Habib has actually done videos where they've showed they've put this fish oil into styrofoam cups and it's eaten through the styrofoam cup in a matter of minutes. It's, it's not good. And it's not just the fact that it's fish oil because they put two different cups Two different, the same styrofoam cup, but two of them, mm. a high quality fish oil, a uh, not so high quality fish oil. And <clears throat> the high quality fish oil is not eating through the styrofoam cup. But the problem is that they're expensive mm. because you need to do a couple of things to make sure that it's a high quality fish oil. A, it needs to be produced in a high quality way which is expensive, has to go through all kinds of different processes that are more expensive than the not as high quality companies go through. You have to get it in small containers so that it doesn't oxidize, AKA go rancid after you open it. It has to be in dark colored containers to again prevent oxidation from sunlight coming in. And you have to have glass bottles to prevent the oil from leaching stuff out of the plastic. So there's just this huge list of things that have to be done to make the fish oil not, I don't know, to make the fish oil a high quality fish oil and it's expensive. And you could, you for the one bottle of fish oil sometimes, you could spend that in oily fish sources, like again, smelt, sardines, mackerel, herring, whatever it happens to be. You could say, spend the same amount and get six weeks worth of fish, two months worth of fish, depending on obviously the size of your dog, how much you have to feed, but it's vastly more cost effective. And one of the big problems people have with raw feeding is that they're not sure how to do it in a budget friendly way. So it's much more cost effective to feed fish than it is to feed fish oils for omega threes. Cool. Uh, one of my, actually one of my clients, has had a question and she basically the question of hers is um, let's pretend you know when we are kind of figuring out what to eat we say in a plate we have to have vegetables carbs and meat and mm -hmm. salad on the side let's pretend we're feeding our dog <laughs> what would the plate look like in in, in an example so this is really tough <clears throat> because <laughs> you could have a perfectly balanced bowl that looked like literally just a pile of ground beef, but that pile of ground beef isn't just ground beef. It's a pre-made food that has everything that your dog needs in it. It could also be something that looks like, you know, chicken feet and or duck feet and or uh, turkey feet <laughs> along with different meat sources, mussels, oysters, ground up vegetables or fermented vegetables along with bone broth, goat's milk, <laughs> kefir, coconut oil, coconut oil. I mean, it's <laughs> so, this is one of those reasons why doing, these are the three, in my opinion, there's three viable ways to and there's multiple ways in these three different sections, we'll call them, to responsibly feed your dog a raw and fresh food diet. One of them is pre-mades, like we've already talked about. Uh, the second one is to have somebody build this diet for you, mm -hmm. 
where you essentially just have to fill in the blanks. Hit you, sir, you're, you're shaking the camera. Could you stop <laughs> it? Thank you very much. So number two being somebody building the diet for you and you essentially just say, you know, Ronnie told me to feed eight ounces of beef or pork. And so I fed eight ounces of beef or, beef or pork along with all these other things. Or you take the more time consuming but less expensive way in most cases, which is learning how to do it yourself, which is where, where I come in. Either way, you should be working with somebody that can help you do it responsibly because there is no, this is the diet. Like mm. there is, that's one of the biggest problems with, with kibble is <clears throat> you can go to the store and get kibble and supposedly, according to them, feed that same thing to the Chihuahua that you're feeding to the Great Dane. And nutritionally speaking, it's just uh, asinine. <laughs> I mean, the amount of the amount of bone, like this is just a really arbitrary example, but the amount of nutrients that will be required to build the amount of bone is going to be inside of a Great Dane is significantly greater than what is going to be required to build the bones in a Chihuahua. But, and people say, well, then you just feed more of the food. When it's like, well, yes, but then you're also getting more of all of the other things too. So <clears throat> it's just irresponsible to say that there's a, for me to say, you would feed exactly this and exactly this and exactly this. And this is exactly what your bowl would look like because right. the, every dog is different. That's exactly why we use the 80, 10, five, five as a starting framework. And I like to call it a framework because that's where we set everything and then build other pieces off of it to complete it. But <clears throat> it's a good place to start, but we can't stop there. You know, well, I have two questions. So <clears throat> when you say 80, 10, 5, 5, mm -hmm. so first of all, that could change in future. Maybe it's going to be 60, 20, 10, 5, something like that. There's could so it, many. There's so many. Could change. It varies then. Yeah. So if we're looking at, if we say 80, 10, 5, 5 specifically, what we are talking about is a prey model diet, meaning mm -hmm. there's nothing in this diet other than the you know animal parts if we want to be really crude about it there's bone content there's meat content and then there's organs mm -hmm. super basic uh and there's nothing else <clears throat> but there's all kinds of other versions out there you know there's the there's you know 60 20 this that there's there's so many different versions. Some of them account for vegetables. Some of them account for minimal amount of vegetables. Some of them account for up to as much as 25% vegetables. Um, some are for adult dogs. Some are for puppies. And then it gets even more complicated, which is why I really recommend that people, no matter how they do it, they either just let somebody do it for them or they get their education down because then we start getting into things that are even more complicated. Like, you know, what was the sourcing for your food? Do we need to increase the amount of a B or C because it doesn't have as much nutrients in it because of how it was farmed or grown or raised. So there's, there is no, as much as I would love to give your client an exact picture. I'm like, this is exactly what a dog bowl should look like. It doesn't exist. And so to simplify, <laughs> this is what, we figure out I, that this is what I get from this that you have to know and understand your specifically your dog and uh, and program the meal exactly specifically to your dog yes is that what you're saying yes and think about it kind of like if you were let's say you and your friend right you and your friend are gonna go to the gym and at the gym, you're going to hire a personal trainer and you're going to hire a nutritionist, right? And they're going to help you with your diet and they're going to help you with your exercise. And you guys are just going to get super fit and healthy because it's January or whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you two are not going to have the same diet. 
Like, let's say that, and in this case, let's say that both, both of you guys are middle-aged white men, or in the dog example, you're both seven-year-old German shepherds. Mm. You're not going to need the exact same things. Maybe your friend weighs 10 or 15 more pounds than you do. Maybe you weigh 10 or 15 pounds more than your friend does. Maybe your friend has joint issues, so they're going to need something that has more glucosamine in it to make sure that your joints don't hurt all the time. Maybe you have a problem with um, carbohydrates in your diet and having too many carbohydrates in your diet just makes you just makes you fat and you can't metabolize them and use them for energy. Like it's just, if you and your friend went in at the exact same time, even if you weighed the exact same, even if you were the same age, even if you had the same background, same ethnicity, same everything else, you are going to have different needs because you're different people and our dogs are the same, which is why I can't remember where this came from. And If somebody knows, please comment below and tell me so I can credit people or credit the person when I say it in the future. But feeding the dog in front of you is the most important thing out of all of this. Because if you have the dog that is one of those not as common as people like to say, most of the time they just go through the transition wrong and think they have a dog like this. But if you have one of those dogs out there that just genuinely doesn't do well with raw foods, then you need to not feed them raw foods and you need to do something like home cooked foods. Uh, Maybe you just have that dog that no matter how high quality sourced it is, organic, pasture raised, grass fed, no vaccines or antibiotics or anything ever, has massive problems with beef, you should never feed that dog beef. But your other dog that's the exact same breed, maybe they're even brothers or sisters, have the same parents, they're fine with it. That dog can have beef. I mean, feed the dog in front of you. Whether you want to feed them with a pre-made, whether you want to have somebody build meals for you, or you want to have somebody like myself teach you how to do it yourself, you got to feed the dog that's in front of you. And I, I don't care if no one, like if this is the last video or first video that anybody ever watches on my YouTube channel. They never buy any of my products. They never join my Facebook group, but somehow they go somewhere else with somebody else and they get their dog onto that diet, whatever that perfect diet is for them. Awesome. And that's the goal. There's so many people out there. So I'm not saying go give answers money or go give Ronnie money or give me money. I'm saying that these are some ways that you can do it. Pre-maids, having somebody do it for you or teaching somebody, having somebody teach you how to do it yourself. So thank you for that. But <laughs> let's say we want to know our dog. How do we know our dog? How do we go about finding out how, what our dog needs? What of my dog how do we go is there any way that you can figure it out unfortunately the best tool that we have right now is to start from the best place that we can whether that is a pre-made or having somebody make it for you or somebody teach you how whatever it is and then observe and adjust um <clears throat> there are certain medical cases where maybe you have a dog that has diabetes and they need to be fed a certain way, or you have a dog that has, you know, thyroid issues, then these dogs need to be at least started in a different way than healthy dogs do. But for healthy dogs, you know, average healthy everyday dogs that don't have any medical issues, there's no like, blood test or Star Trek scan that we can do on them and say, this is the perfection for you. Unfortunately, the answer is we start and do as best as we can. And people have heard me say this a thousand times by now, but we observe and we adjust. If oh, you mean you we watch to see if the, the dog is having diarrhea, is it throwing up, if something is popping out or it's, just right. sign. Watch the sign. Yeah. So one really specific and relatable example would be, you know, people say with 80, 10, 5, 5, or whatever the ratio that you find is, they say, start around 3%, right? Start around 3% of your dog's current body weight 
And ideally, that should be a maintenance level for you. When I say that, meaning if you feed with these guidelines, those 80-10-5-5 ratios, if you make them out with 3% of your dog's weight, the idea is that your dog doesn't gain weight, they don't lose weight, they stay right where they're at. Mm -hmm. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you have a dog like my dog Horace, where if he gets any more than, you know, 1.75 to 2% of his body weight, he starts blowing up like a balloon. But then there's other dogs out there where they have to have as high as, you know, four, four and a half, sometimes even 5% and sometimes even more. Yeah, my my ego weight. is like that too. If I feed him a little bit too much, within a week he balloons. <laughs> and, and also i noticed like you know depends on how active we were the week before uh did we hike a lot or didn't we hike a lot they blew he blew right uh, so yeah I, I i see what you mean yeah again that comes back to you know feeding the dog in front of you and maybe again like let's say all right i watched this video with scott and sorrow scott said that omega-3s are essential and so I decided that I need to go and get some fish, right? And I went and got mackerel from the Asian market. And like our dogs here, I gave one of my dogs a whole mackerel and he loved it. I gave that, my other dog a whole mackerel and he was kind of iffy on it. And then 10 minutes later, he threw it up. And he oh. does that every single time that I feed him mackerel, right? Well, then that dog shouldn't probably shouldn't be getting whole mackerel all the time. Or... If you say, I went and watched Scott and he said, omega-3s are ex essential. I don't want to do fish, so I'm going to try oils. You go and get a, a high-quality oil and you feed it to one dog and one dog is totally cool with it. And then the other dog that you have or the other two dogs you have or whatever it is have diarrhea every single time that you feed it and it smells like fish. Like that, that says that it is just going through your dog and it's not getting absorbed. It's not getting used. So use the oil for that one dog that you have and start looking into fish for the other two. And again, unfortunately, I really wish, like if I could figure out a way how I'd be rich forever, <laughs> but, but there's no, there's no way to like take a blood sample from your dog and say, you need exactly this because we don't know exactly yeah what dogs need and and there's so many things can vary so many things have already impacted your dog so many things are invisible so many things are visible that you're misreading there's so many things that can i i see what you mean that can give you headache just to think of it uh, how to figure out but yeah but that brings me to, uh, the, I think the last question would be, what is the future of raw diet? What do you see? Where are we going with raw diet? Uh, you know, we, we had a horrible past in raw diet. You know, people said, oh, raw diet is going to kill dogs. We've <laughs> gone from that. You know, I've heard also many, many years ago that if you feed raw diet, the dog become aggressive. Which yeah. Is, nonsense we've gone from <laughs> that to <laughs> today that many people are realizing how good raw diet is so what do you see the future of raw diet there's so one i see it growing um the as negative as a thought as it is there's simply too many dogs that are suffering from the problems that are caused by processed diets for people to not pay attention. Um, <clears throat> I was actually talking to somebody today in a local completely un raw feeding related uh, Facebook group for my local area. And someone said, I'm looking to get into raw feeding. Um, can somebody help me? And somebody that I've worked with here in my local area, actually, no, you can't go back there. Somebody in my local area actually tagged me and said, you need to talk to Scott. And we went back and forth a little bit. And it basically came down to, I get that this grosses you out a little bit. It's unusual. But when we start looking at things like one in two dogs in America getting cancer, when you can't go back there, child. He just kept trying to go back to my YouTube <laughs> filming area. Um, he wants to be in the show. <laughs> he wants to be in the show. Um, 
when we start looking at how one in two dogs will get cancer in the United States, when we start looking at all this business that's going on with DCM and heart issues, when we start looking at the fact that people are having dogs that do not live anywhere near as long as they live, when we start looking at 150 million pounds of processed kibble and other processed foods being recalled in the last seven years from these big companies. And when we start looking at the fact that, you know, pentobarbital being the euthanasia drug for cats and dogs being found in cat and dog food, there's just, there's no alternative. There's no logical alternative for people to not start looking at other options. So one, I think that it's going to continue to grow the no matter how many scare tactic videos like the whole professor kitty that hills put out video mm -hmm. saying if you want to feed a raw diet that's great just go and get an eight-year nutrition science degree and like no uh, no matter how many videos like that that are coming out people are going to continue seeking out this information uh, another thing that i see is a lot of raw food companies coming up which is one reason why I say look into the reputation of these companies. You know, just because they're a startup, don't, don't look past them just because they're new. Just mm -hmm. ask the right questions. You know, are you balancing according to NRC? Are you balancing according to AFCO? What's your sourcing like? You know, look at whether the processes that they're using and whether or not they're complete and balanced is something that you want to work with you know and there's ways to get raw food that's not complete and balanced and you can add in the extra bits yourself but know the company that you're going to buy the food from is the thing because there's going to be a lot of them coming up they there's a new raw food company that pops up like every single day and that's like a literal statement <laughs> <laughs> that's cool um, uh, so, so uh, you know I know I said the last question, but what is, <laughs> what is one, one more question? What is hot now? What is in fashion in raw diet? You know, like you touched on uh, fermented vegetables. Uh, what, is in, what, is, what is hot now? What is <laughs> cool now? <laughs> one thing that is, I mean, obviously there's right now, there's everybody freaking out about the DCM diets, but that's not really about raw feeding. It's just people asking the questions about it. But, the one thing that I see getting really big is fermented foods overall and reproductive foods. And what is so, reproductive food? So reproductive foods, not meaning reproductive organs like, you know, uh, testicles, ovaries, but reproductive foods being foods that either, um, hey, you, you over there. No. Uh, being foods that either created a life or sustained a life in their entirety all on their own. So this would be something like an egg. Like, you know, we have a fertilized chicken egg. It literally makes a life. That's a right. reproductive food. It reproduces. Right. Um, or raw milk, raw being the key part there. Raw, organic, pasture-raised, grass-fed, non-GMO, um, raw milk. You know, I'm not a cow expert. I've said this on other interviews. I'm not a cow expert or a goat expert, but for a certain period of time, that's the only thing that that calf eats. You know, we, and we can take the same thing back to, um, you know, the, the milk of dogs. For a certain period of time, there is nothing else that that puppy survives on or that kitten survives on other than milk. So what is a complete reproductive food? It's supporting reproduction if you want to call it that but the definition that i like to give it is a food that either sustains a life in its entirety like the milk or creates a life in its entirety like eggs and people are using and i'm really pushing this with my students my you know my boot camp people my one-on-one -on -one clients core students everybody to feed reproductive foods because if there is some kind of unidentified nutritional hole in your diet, feeding reproductive foods is one of the best ways to fill those gaps because they are, they quite literally contain, maybe not in perfect amounts, but they contain everything that is necessary for life because they're sustaining wow. life and they're complete, they're creating life. So to say that it doesn't have what is necessary for life is just, 
it's just silly. It's like, well, if an egg didn't have everything that was necessary for life, where did the chicken come from? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is amazing. You know, you know, Scott, we can talk forever about this topic. Uh, and unfortunately, life time life comes around, and also time is limiting us. But I would love to talk to you again about raw diet. There's so much to learn about raw diet, and I want to uh, pick your brain and just go through everything. <laughs> and we need to do more videos uh, such as this uh, because people have to learn. There's, I think, there's first of all, there's not much enough uh, information about raw diet. Uh, and the way you share information on, uh, with your pack and with your group and with your all the um, avenues that you have, I still think we need more information to be exposed and to be out there to public. Because uh, personally, myself, for example, I have uh, I have a doggy daycare, and I would say 95% of my clients of doggy daycare they are still feeding kibble. No matter how much I inform them, <laughs> no matter, no matter how much I, I uh, talk about it, it's just they they can't uh, they can't fathom the idea of feeding raw diet. They don't understand the benefits of it, and they don't realize what they're missing actually. So we need to push. We need to do more of these videos, and we keep talking about it until yes. everybody changes and becomes raw fit. Raw, feed, uh, raw feeder. So thank you very much, Scott. Uh, any last word before we end this uh, session? The, the parting words that I would give anybody that's looking to get into this diet is go through it and go through this transformation of going from being a dog owner to becoming a raw feeder. Do it with either support and or education, meaning either have somebody like, again, you know, Ronnie that can like build diets or answers pet food, a pre-made, something like that. Either have the support to fill in your educational gaps because you don't know what you're doing yet or get that education as exciting as it can be and as enthusiastic about your dog's health as you want to be, you owe it to them to go through the proper steps, either feed something or use a service that makes something for you to where you don't have to think about it and you can just feed it or feed exactly what Ronnie said in her custom meal plan stuff or go through and get your education. Just don't, don't look at a bowl on Instagram and say, this is a pretty bowl of dog food and then go feed that. You gotta, you gotta get your education is what I, either go support and or education to make sure that you're not doing more harm than good because as amazing as fresh food is even dr karen becker the most followed veterinarian on the planet you've had her on your channel has said the only thing worse than a poor processed diet is a poorly put together homemade diet right. so support yeah. and or education are things that you need to do this process i dare say safely and responsibly exactly so my last word also would be on top of that would be look your dog has no choice in making their what they're eating you're the one who makes that choice what to put in that bowl you can either put crap in that bowl you can <laughs> put the best food in, the, in that bowl and the best food doesn't mean is the most expensive food it means is more uh, much more healthier and more, much more natural and species appropriate food for your dog. They can make that choice. You're the one who has that choice and the power to make that decision. Don't feed your dog blindfully. Don't just give what the market is telling you to feed. The market is there to make money. Uh, there are companies on raw diet, they want to make money too. They, they will push their product too, but you have to be educated. You have to understand what you're feeding your dog. Why are you feeding your dog that? What are the benefits, pros and cons of feeding this food that you choose to feed? And from coming from a raw feeder and Scott, also a raw feeder for years, I've seen tremendous amount of benefits 
when I switched from kibble to raw. Not only my dog is vibrant, healthy, um, nine years old. He's a nine-year-old, but it looks and feels like a puppy. Mm -hmm. I don't visit the vet. My vet hardly sees me. I only go once a year and I say, hello, I'm here to check my dog's health. And my vet is, um, you know, one of those holistic vets. It's not one of those who pushes kibble uh, to their clients, pushes whatever works for the dog. That's what it means. And I just go for a test and he's good, he's healthy, he's Stools are always healthy. Uh, he, he's vibrant. He's healthy. Doesn't have any health issues. And I, uh, my goal is to help him to live 20 years. For a beagle to live 20 years is, is something that we don't see. It. But there are dogs who can live on a good, healthy life. Uh, and diet is one of them uh, that you can change and provide a good, healthy life. and uh, you know, provide the good food and you'll see the, the best results. So that's my part. And Scott, thank you very much for being uh, here and talking to us and letting us know uh, what we need to do. As I said, we need to do a lot more videos and we will do it. Uh, we'll make time and hopefully our audience are gonna make time to learn as well. Thank you very much. And where we can learn about Scott, the dog dad. <laughs> well, with this being over on my channel, I hope that you guys know where to find me already. But if you don't, go to rawfeeding101.com. Everything is there. The, the course is there. The consultations are there. The six-week boot camp is there. The YouTube videos are there. The downloadable resources are there. Go to rawfeeding101.com. And Sorrow, where can we find your epic stuff? I suggest to go to Sorrow Dog Training on YouTube and my, all my information and contact information is right there. Uh, just, I, my goal is to educate dog owners to become an educated dog lover. Every dog owner is a dog lover. I want them to become an educated dog lover and that has to do with training, diet, nutrition, uh, health, everything so i provide all kinds of info information there so sorrow dog training is the channel to go and at the top of this video the very first thing in the description i will put a link to sorrow's channel for you guys to click on and go over to Great. so it should be thank really easy <clears throat> so thank all you right. so much sorrow i'm going to go ahead and disconnect us here guys go and check out sorrow's channel Sor sorrow's channel <laughs> sorrow's channel <laughs> sorrow's channel click the link that's at the top of the description to get there or just type in sorrow s-a-r-o just like we see on his shirt dog training and you'll find his face along with his little buddies there that you can see right yeah. there. <laughs> all right thank you guys. Very much and have fun with your dog there you go